spent more time playing old games than I did new ones this year. Uh, there ended up not being like a ton I was really hyped for. Uh, most new games this year I ended up stumbling upon rather than like anticipating, but I also took some time this year to catch up on a lot of old games that I either missed out on or have uh, been meaning to play for a while. I finished God of War earlier this year. Ooh, the sense of weight you get from that game's combat. Wow, it is brutal as hell. And I really love the story too. The chemistry between these characters, that's what makes it work so well. A lot of genuinely endearing moments. You bet your ass I'm excited for the sequel. Ragnarok, man, bring it on. The Witness was another game I really enjoyed this year. I'm not super into puzzle games or whatever, but this is one that really clicked with me. I find my big dumb gamer brain is really good at piecing things together and like noticing patterns and stuff, so I had a brain blast with this guy. Some of those puzzles were really cool. And I got that big brain going on, boy, because I beat that whole maze thing, got the platinum trophy and everything. Mm, look at me, I'm the cool gamer loser. <laughs> oh yeah, I beat Hollow Knight. Oh my, oh, I totally see why people have been trying to get me to play that thing for so freaking long. This is like one of my favorite 2D games ever now. And how can you not love these little dudes? It's one of the toughest and most fun games I've ever played. And it's one of the cutest too. I mean, come on, look at these guys. There ain't a character in this entire game that I don't love. I also replayed all the Uncharted games through the uh, Nathan Drake collection. I haven't really played them all since they were new, but uh, oh yeah, still good, still love that series. Oh man, when it comes to polished third person shooting and climbing and a, and a pretty decent story with really good characters, Uncharted still got it. <laughs> I also beat Bloodborne again. I don't think I'm ever gonna stop playing this thing. Am I allowed to retroactively change a game of the year? Let's replace Uncharted 4 with Bloodborne, cause come on. And while we're at it, why don't we replace Resident Evil 2 Remake with Outer Wilds? Oh my god, guys, this, this game is something magical. I swear to god, I, I have not felt a desire to see everything this strongly since playing Yume Nikki in LSD Dream Emulator for the first time way back in high school. Exploration, astrophysics, and entropy, man. If you could describe some games as an existential nightmare, this is an existential wet dream. Everybody who likes lore-driven games about exploring, you need to play this thing. It is really slow-paced, though, so it's definitely not for everybody, but it is one of those games where the people it does click with, it is going to click hardcore. Played a lot of Mario 64 and Sunshine, again with the uh, 3D All-Stars collection out and all. As much as I wish they did a lot more with that thing, I gotta admit it is pretty convenient to have two of my favorite games of all time on the Switch. Cop out they don't have Galaxy 2 though, I don't know what they were thinking of that. But buddy, having it at the ready to grab a couple of stars or shines just whenever I want, the convenience of it is undeniably fantastic. Pikmin 3 getting co-op for the campaign was pretty freaking awesome. Oh that Switch port, oh it was handled so freaking well. If you haven't played Pikmin 3 yet, get on it man. And that new version of Xenoblade. That was also something I grabbed. Yeah, still good. New models look pretty great. Still one of my favorite JRPGs. But it's also 90 hours long, which means I played the intro again. That was fun. Yeah, this past month, I've pretty much just been sitting here with my Switch and PS4 while everybody else got those shiny new Xboxes and PS5s. I wasn't so lucky. Haven't been able to play anything next gen yet. I really want to give that Demon Souls remake a try. Spider-Man too. But I don't got to tell you how hard it is to land one of those things, especially in Canada. Probably going to wait till I get a PS5 before playing more Cyberpunk because like, good lord, what an embarrassment that launch has been. How often do you see a launch so bad they issue a public apology and remove it from the PlayStation Store. I was really stoked for this thing for years and years and like, it's fun, but this is inexcusable. What the hell ever happened to coming when it's ready? There's some stuff I played this year, but nah, yeah, let's get into it. What are the 10 games from 2020 that I loved most this year? Well, I didn't get to play everything I wanted to. I still haven't got a chance to play through Yakuza 7 or a Doom Eternal, but I do still have quite the collection of bangers for you. These are the 10 raddest games I played from 2020. Number 10. Bingo! We've got a winner! Here's one that kind of went under the radar, Journey to the Savage Planet. You're yet another poor loser astronaut that got suckered into exploring one of the galaxy's strangest planets, full of violent, goofy critters, beautiful alien environments, tons of stuff that'll kill ya, and lots and lots of goop. It's a co-op shooter with a large focus on exploration and the gathering of resources. While you'll be shooting a lot of aliens, I really loved unlocking all the different abilities, granting me access to new weird areas, and figuring out how to interact with all the weird things I'd find here. There's a pretty great sense of progression here. The 
further you go, the better gear you unlock and the stronger you'll get. And there's tons of health upgrades hidden all around the world, which is a really great incentive to fully explore all these bizarre areas. It's got a really surreal sense of humor too, like you'll be walking around your ship and they'll start playing these Tim and Eric inspired commercials advertising these eldritch horror products. Just adding sub-zero radioactive water to a microlife powder packet and see your mom's inhabitants grow in just minutes. The freaking editing of these videos, it is absolutely hilarious. From the bottom of the oceans, and now to the stars! Everything about this game is so silly, like even the soundtrack, that banjo, you're walking around like a bang, 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 bang. If you're looking for another worldly co-op game with tons of exploration, weird humor, and fun upgrades, take a journey to this bizarre planet. Just don't breathe the spores. Oh no. Number nine. If there's any one genre you cannot make me go anywhere near, it's roguelikes. I remember playing stuff like Binding of Isaac a while ago, and I don't know, I just could not get into that kind of game. But I've been wrong about disliking genres before, like I always thought I didn't like Metroidvanias, but I loved Hollow Knight. I guess it's all about finding the one that's right for you, and Risk of Rain 2? That's the one that got me on board. You've got tons of playable characters, all with unique movement options and abilities. I had a blast throwing myself at this thing again and again with friends, trying out all the characters and finding which one suits me best, and it was really fun experimenting to see which characters benefited from certain items in certain scenarios. I think my favorites are Multi and Loader. I love characters I can get around, you know? I mean, I love platformers because I love character movement, and that grapple hook dash combo had me flinging myself all over the place, landing each blow as I turned around. Multi, on the other hand, involves a good blend of attack types, switching between sniping, machine gunning, and shotgunning. I enjoy feeling like a team turret sometimes, you know? If you want a game that's replayable as hell, got tight polished mechanics, great co-op, and character variety to let you find your own footing, Risk of Rain 2 is a hell of a time. Number eight. Where are you? Uh, Here. Where is it? Here. And another co-op game. Well, co-op horror is not something I see done well very often. It is a really good concept, but you kind of need some really unique ideas to make it interesting. Otherwise, it might just boil down to shooting zombies with your friends, and that's fun and all, but, you know, I've just kind of done that a billion times at this point. Phasmophobia is one of the coolest multiplayer experiences I've ever had. You and some friends team up to explore a haunted house, using a wide variety of gear to prove the existence of a spirit, narrow down which one it is, and get the hell out of there before it kills you. You'll set up security cameras, scan the area with a black light, measure each room with the EMF, take temperature readings. You can only hold up to three items each, so you'll have to divvy them up between you and your crew. A lot of coordination and planning, working together to set everything up and gathering paranormal evidence before you get killed. You just scared the shit out of me, dude. <laughs> Proximity chat is what makes this game work so freaking well. Like, seriously, do yourself a favor. Don't use Discord. Use the in-game chat instead. You can only hear each other when you're close by. If you stray too far away, then you'll have to use the radio. Uh, here, I'll come back upstairs. Now imagine being alone going up to the second floor as your friend set up the gear downstairs in the kitchen. You're reporting your findings, and then the radio gets cut. You guys still there? You still hear me? Oh no. Your friends have no idea you died, until they kind of just decide that's probably what happened because you're no longer responding to their calls. Then you come back as a poltergeist, you can hear and see your friends, but they can't hear or see you. So I guided them back to my body by picking it up and throwing around this ball. They couldn't see me, but they could see what I was throwing around. It's these kinds of moments that this game's delicately designed voice chat is amazing at creating. It's genuinely scary, and the most most fun I've had with multiplayer all freaking year. If you're a fan of the horror genre and you want a fantastic co-op game, look no further. This is a must play. What's up, homie? You want another picture? Here, I'll take another picture of you. Go away. Oh, you're so scary. Number seven. Media Molecule has always been pretty widely known for crafting playgrounds of creativity. What began as a level editor for a side-scroller eventually grew into something so much more broad. Now you can craft literally anything you can dream of. When I first got Dreams, I immediately began to check out some of the other games that other players have made, and this was the first thing I saw. This was literally the first thing I stumbled upon after putting in the disc. Well, these are pretty cool bananas. 
There's a lot of dumb crap on dreams. Some of it hilarious, some of it low brow and low effort. You know, a lot of memes and junk. But hey, don't let the funny YouTube videos fool ya. There is an endless supply of genuinely good ideas. Stuff that's well made, well thought out, or simply unique. When I saw just how well you could get something like a Sonic fan game working in this thing, that was the moment I realized just how robust this software was. Whether it's an original game or something based on something existing, there's evidently a lot of passion being put into some of these projects. I toyed around with this thing a lot this past year, and while I didn't learn every intricacy of the toolkit, it does get rather complicated. I did manage to scrap together a game based on my own dreams, Yume Nitro. I just grabbed publicly available assets and threw them all together and made something, but hey, the ability to do that is part of what makes this game so accessible too. Not everybody has the patience to sit through long video tutorials, so you know what you can do instead? You can take apart other people's stuff to see how it works how they programmed it, how they put it all together. I think Media Molecule understands that different people like learning in different ways, so being able to do this really helped me get into the swing of things. Whether you're into making stuff or just seeing all the amazing things other people have made, Dreams is the best of the best when it comes to player-created content, and when it comes to the wizards of creativity themselves, I'd expect no less. Number six. <laughs> I kind of have a love-hate relationship with The Last of Us. I think it has one of the most engaging and powerful character-driven stories I've ever watched unfold in a video game. Yet, as a big fan of survival horror that's played a lot of those types of games, I found the gameplay painfully rudimentary. It's fun, it's good, it's super polished, but it's pretty damn basic. Last of Us 2, I kind of have the opposite thoughts on. I didn't like the story quite as much as the first game. I mean, I still enjoyed it a lot. These aren't characters that have some powerful performances behind them. This game is a roller coaster ride through hell and back. It is a miserable, grueling, and exhilarating experience. But it just couldn't top the first game, and I didn't really expect it to. But on the other hand, that basic watered-down survival gameplay, that was fleshed out into something that really clicked with me. Uncharted 4 blew me away with its jungle gym level design, full of ins and outs, verticality, enemies from all angles. You were on the move, man! The balance between gunplay and mobility is what made that game so much fun for me. So naturally, I was pretty freaking stoked when I saw Naughty Dog take that jungle gym philosophy and apply it once again here. So like, imagine all that, right? But now it's survival horror. You've got guys all around you, so you gotta keep on your toes. Crawling, moving, setting up traps, using weapons that don't give away your location. I'm gonna blow this guy up with a bow and arrow. <laughs> These are big open levels that you're gonna be frantically zipping on through as you try to desperately survive each encounter like the cockroach you are. But one of the biggest things for me was how much much fun it was to explore this world. I know a lot of people write off the high budget graphics as Sony throwing a bunch of money at a project, but like, no, I genuinely do believe it contributes a lot to just how interesting each location can be. I freaking love abandoned buildings. It's like one of my favorite things ever. Uh, there's something about walking around and looking in each room and seeing everything that's in there. All I can think about is like, man, someone used to live here, you know, and all their stuff is still here. That's kind of like a story in itself. And all those little details too, like how there's still Halloween stuff everywhere because the outbreak happened in October. It was an amazing experience just walking around and soaking in the environments. Man, seeing Naughty Dog flesh out the gameplay this much, it's got me excited to see how far they'll bring it if they make a third one. I'm kind of hoping they move on from Ellie and give Abby her own game. I think I liked Abby a lot more because she reminded me so much of Joel, so a part three bouncing off of her, that could be a cool idea. You ever have one of those game ideas you've always wanted to exist and then someday some random dude just makes it? For me, that game is Umarangi Generation. I've been pretty big into photography ever since film school, and I can tell you right now, there's a lot of intricacies to it that most games with photography mechanics just do not explore. But Umarangi's got the full package, dude. You got interchangeable lenses, you can roll the frame, and tons of sliders to take full control over exactly how you want each picture to look. And what's a better setting for snapping some sick pics than the shitty future? One that takes a good blend of inspiration between Jet Set Radio and 90s anime like Evangelion. If you want a game that does punk even better than cyberpunk, this is it, man. Because, you know, punk's all about the distaste for establishment. The man, man. Civil unrest, hating the government, street kids and funky dealers. It's punky, funky, and with the new macro DLC, 
it's now pretty chunky. There's some seriously sick stuff in the DLC, dude. You got roller skates for better movement, huge new areas like a mecha hanger, even got a Game Boy camera, that's pretty sick. The dude even added unlockable knee pads to let you get closer to the ground after I criticized the game for not letting you do that. And the resulting reference to my home province was something I really appreciated. Nobody cares about Nova Scotia unless it's Trailer Park Boys, right? But seriously, man, hit the streets, snap some pics, and express yourself. If you've ever wanted to get into photography, this actually isn't a bad way of doing it. Switchport coming soon. Number four. It really is about time, huh? Holy hell, dude. I was not expecting to like this game as much as I did. I never really cared that much for the Crash series, but hey, despite that, I decided to give Crash 4 a shot and I ended up loving it. Toys for Bob did such an amazing job bringing these characters to life. The bouncy, expressive animation that pushes each scene forward, they really nailed all the characters. The exchanges between them all were a lot of fun to watch play out. It is that tight, precise action you'd expect from a classic Crash game, but with new characters and abilities that had some much needed variety. Those quantum masks were brilliant, altering the way you navigate each environment. A popping in the platforms, changing time and gravity, or launching yourself in a whirlwind of chaos. Those multiple characters were really great too. They shook things up without straying too far from the core gameplay like a Crash 3 would do a lot. A Dingo Dial is easily my favorite of the bunch. That leaf blower is a blast to play with. Crash is back and he's better than ever. And I know that's kind of a cliche thing to say, but I really do think that. Now, now let's pray Toys for Bob will do the same for Spyro, or better yet, they said they want to do Space Station Silicon Valley, what? That would be amazing! If there's one game I was most surprised by this year, it was definitely Bug Snacks. The idea of this being a sort of spiritual successor to Ape Escape is what got me interested, but they do a whole lot more with that elevator pitch than I expected. Bug Snacks is a playground of mechanics that gives you the freedom to figure out how to track and snag each snack. I had such a good time walking around and learning all the weird ways I could combine my gadgets and learning how to make the Bug Snacks interact with each other so I could catch them. And despite being such a cute, kitty looking game, Bug Snacks features a cast of very real feeling characters, all with belief issues and troubled relationships that you'll find yourself lending a hand and helping out with. They'll come up to you and they'll be like, I'm Linky Stinky Butt, and then have like really good and believable writing? The way it takes itself so seriously with all the silly wording and stuff, it reels you in with this endearing goofiness before you find yourself legitimately invested in the drama. If you're looking for a super dumb game that fully embraces its silliness to deliver a well-written and wholesome story, Bug Snacks is where to go. New Horizons could not have come at a better time. It released right when the pandemic kind of became a serious thing, and a time sink like Animal Crossing is exactly what I needed. I've been a die-hard fan of Animal Crossing ever since the first one. It's a series that really does mean a lot to me, and New Horizons felt like the one that really brought us all together the most. I could not see any of my friends for months, but Animal Crossing gave us a way to hang out, spend time together, share resources and experiences. And it was a calming experience I had fishing, hunting for bugs, the usual suspects of repetitive activities that I take a bizarre comfort in repeating again and again. It's the kind of game that I love to chip away at, maybe an hour a day. What can I say? I love my daily dozen, dude. I was always excited to wake up to my Switch beside me and check out what things I could do each morning before getting to work. Ooh, the sense of freedom you got with this one. You finally got control over the entire town. Building fencing, placing objects. You start with less than ever before, but you end with more than ever before. I built a big suburban neighborhood for all my villagers, each one with a yard full of things that reflect their character. I fancied up the museum with some stone pathways and outdoor exhibits. Over here we got a spooky graveyard, an outdoor wrestling ring up on the cliffs, and my huge garden of golden roses that I spent an entire month making. A little bit at a time, but still, it took me a month to do this. There is a lot of issues I have with this game, you know, it's in desperate need of quality of life improvements, but as far as my experiences go with it, I think it's my second favorite just behind Wild World. And in a world that's falling apart, more and more each day, New Horizons gave me a little spot of my own that I was free to do whatever I wanted with. And in 2020, I think we all really needed that. So thanks, Tom. You're a pal. Number one. Yet, it's more often the stranger experiences that I find leave the biggest impact on me. Throughout my YouTube career, I've stumbled upon some of the most interesting games I've ever played. 
Hylix was but one of many, being a simple surrealist claymation game done in RPG Maker. And it was this past summer that Mason Lindroth finally finished the sequel to his claymation cult classic. Like, yo, the visuals in this game are unlike anything else. From the impressive, dazzling animations that turn your brain to goo, to the worlds made from real 3D scans of clay models, all tied together with an acid wash look that fully embraces the psychedelic twang of its soundtrack. Hylix 2 is a classic style RPG, bouncing between over world exploration, more focused areas, and turn-based battles. The structure will feel similar to like a classic Final Fantasy, airship and all, a full of side stuff and secrets to beef up your party so you can take on Gibby and his army of unfolded brain nonsense. This game seriously feels like somebody took a human brain and wringed it out like a sponge, letting every drop of goopy brain matter spill into a canvas of clay. And it's that very shapelessness that these characters act against in protest, finding their own shape, their own identity. Round up a gang of misfit punks and rebel against against the resurrected King Gibby. You can't take our shape away from us. That's kind of how I see this game's bizarre plot. Hylix 2 knocks it out of the frickin' park for me, man. It is everything I've wanted from a surrealist game. The battle animations, the amazing soundtrack, the exploration, the bizarre writing and characters. It is easily the most James thing I've played all year. I really couldn't have asked for more from this thing. And uh, on that note, I want to thank everybody for watching my review about this game. It was one of the most viewed videos I put out this year. And this is the thing. When I see people so open to clicking on stranger experiences, that makes me really happy. Because YouTube only rewards people for covering the most popular shit in the most disposable way these days. And because of that, it is becoming a little bit harder to uh, sustain myself making carefully produced and polished videos. Like, this shit doesn't earn the gangbusters money people think it does. They take too long to make for that. But like, I don't want to stop doing it that way, because it wouldn't be me, you know? Sometimes I get annoyed comments about how I don't upload as often these days, and I'm sorry, but I gotta put my foot down and tell ya, I am not going to start releasing rushed videos. So tough shit if you're impatient. I don't care. I'm staying true to what I want to do, and that's that. You know, as I get older and my life becomes busier and busier, it, it does get harder to put out videos as often as I'd like, and unfortunately, there's just not really much I can really do about that other than try my best. You know, these videos take a long time to make, and I'm just one guy. No team, no editors, no nothing. It's just me. And that's how I want to keep it, because there are so many changes I make to the script, to the edits, to everything that happen while I'm in the editing phase that I feel like that would just, it would get completely lost if I got someone else to do it all for me, you know? So that's what I want to do in 2021. I'm going to keep making what I want to make, but uh, I do think I want to cover more weirder stuff this year. I feel like I kind of like fell out of the swing of things on that, and I do want to cover more of that. I want to get back into that. I want to finally talk about this thing this year. I've been wanting to cover this since the day I started this channel. And today's the year baby you know what I meant by that and I also want to cover all the Jimmy Neutron games um, everyone asked me to talk about Spongebob but the thing is like everybody talks about Spongebob everybody's already covered Spongebob I like Jimmy Neutron I want to talk about Jimmy Neutron and I also want to do one video that's like really non-traditional for this channel and I want to try not putting my name or face on it just to see how it'll perform I want to try and get a million views with it I think I can do it probably not I don't know if that'll go well or bad or whatever but that's going to be a huge passion project that I'm willing to take a big risk on but no yeah like seriously thank you so much for watching me and supporting me over the years and stuff like I really do appreciate that so I'm gonna keep doing my best and hopefully you'll look forward to whatever dumb bullshit I'll be putting out in 2021 I hope it'll be a better year than 2020 was but you know as much as I'm sure everybody else is saying the same thing I sincerely don't believe it will be any better a year unless we make it better so hey Let's all try our best this year, man. And I know that sounds like a cheesy way to end this video, but that's coming from the heart, not from the fart. <laughs> Happy New Year, guys. Yo, what's up? Welcome to the end of the video, dude. I uh, appreciate you watching the whole thing. I really do. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about what I played this year and why I liked it. I don't know. <laughs> if you want to support what I do, I got a $1 podcast up on Patreon. Uh, Brady and I do a monthly podcast where we just shoot the shit and talk about whatever. I <laughs> don't